Good evening and happy Friday. Hashtag our A-year-A GSC global family. I am Dre Aveda, coyote walking in this world and real life as Slato Pueblo superhero. Proud, two-spirited, indigenous warrior with grandparents from Acoma, Laguna, and from the Philippines family. But don't forget, this coyote is also the chair of your American Education Research Association Graduate Student Council. We are a family of 7,000 strong from around the world. And we are here Zooming live from the Critical Race Studies and Education Annual Association meeting hosted here at the University of Delaware. And I'm here with my family. Everyone tonight is here and we are part of the Crisea family. We are also currently either mentoring in the Ujima program, which is a badass mentoring program that is raising up budding critical race scholars so that we can change the world. And you know that these fireside chats are monthly events brought to your brought to you to add value to our graduate student family. And as always, they are co-hosted not only by this coyote, but your amazing Andy Layton, our chair elect. I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to her so she can do an introduction. And dear family, as we introduce ourselves, can you please tell us your affiliations, your research interests, how you came to our Crisea family, and what you hope to say to the world? Because you know this webinar is going to be part of our official library. So please check our website next week, aura.net. Don't forget to click on the tab graduate students at the top. And then after that, on the left hand side, look for our AURA GSE library of online resources. It's now off to you, sis Andy. <laughs> And excuse me uh, uh, for not having my video on. I'm uh, in State College, Pennsylvania, and it's raining here. So things are, my uh, video is a little shaky, but just know that I'm here. Well, I just want to say first, everyone, all of us need a side of Dre in the morning and when we have our slope days. Oh my God, she just living, just her spirit is just like a, like a fireball for the lack of better words. But uh, I'm Andy Layton and I am the chair elect of AERA. I was nominated for this position. I am extremely excited to learn and grow with all of you. Uh, I love my, my leader as well as my friend and sister Dre and all of you that are here. Something that I would say about my research uh, interests is I claim that I am a critical race scholar in the making. Uh, my whole life and my whole drive is to make schools more equitable for marginalized groups and students of color. Uh, you see some of my uh, writings out there in the world, everything is always on some type of race issue or how we can be more accountable, how we can really make this country live up to its its creed of what it's supposed to be. So I am just really happy to be here. I'm really happy to shake things up with all of you and I'm ready to learn. So I am gonna pass it back to my sister Dre so we can continue to introduce the great people that are here with us. Thanks again. No problem. I am going to introduce next family my long-term member both for the youth group loud leaders organizing to unite and decriminalize which basically called out this coyote from the sidelines of being a researcher and making me have the drive to become a scholar activist family this amazing group of youth literally transformed my life they were 75 percent formerly incarcerated also um, a majority LGBTQ. And these, these students literally went to the roundhouse, detention centers, focus group, and used their lived experiences and their voices as powerhouses to go to the powers that be and make that change. So um, that was amazing work. And I owe that wonderful experience to my mentor, Dr. Steve Desai. Um, and currently we're working on the APS Ethnic Studies Research Team. And I will let him talk about how he has influenced um, critical race theory and the field and basically rescues us one person at a time, family. Thank you so much. And by the way, family, I call him my 
honorary academic debt because we all need we need those people in our lives the ones that raise us up pull us through even when things get ugly the ones at the end of the day that are really family so we're just doing a general introduction um, so name, affiliation, your background a little bit in CRT, um, and, and what you'd like to say to the world as our opening. Yeah. Well, I appreciate uh, Dre's energy. Um, so my name is Steve Desai, and I'm an associate professor here at University of New Mexico on Pueblo, Dene, and Apache land. Um, I got involved with CRT way back in the day as a graduate student. Uh, I was fortunate to be at UCLA where we had Dr. Denny Solorzano and other amazing scholars um, <clears throat> who have heavily influenced and paved the way and created a space really to allow CRT to be in the academy. Um, as Dre said, she and I first met when we were on a, a project together for juvenile justice. Uh, we did a white part project where we had a tremendous opportunity to work with system involved youth. And as she was saying, you know, I want to say we were, we were probably one of the first in the nation to do a white part project where youth were key partners in the um, facilitation of WIPAR um, in, in terms of doing focus groups, interviews inside the detention center um, with different justice programs like drug court or community custody program. Um, and then after that, we worked together on a ethnic studies project uh, here in, Albu in New Mexico and um, that's pretty much it. And I just want to thank Dre for the opportunity to speak to y'all. Thank you so much. And next family, let me introduce you to the new powerhouse of our family, our amazing mentee, Shay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Shay, as you mentioned, and I am new to the Crisea family. Uh, this is my first conference, and I am a doc student, a budding CRT scholar, I'd like to say. Um, so I'm just glad to be here, and I am so glad that I've been connected with Dr. Desai and Dre um, along this academic journey that I'm starting to take. So I've already had tons of fun here gotten a lot of information, connected with a lot of great people. Um, so I am happy to be here. Woohoo! And before we get started, family, we would just like to take a moment to acknowledge and welcome all of our amazing 43 participants we have tonight, family. <laughs> Woohoo! We are making history, right? How often does the American Education Research Association have a chance to highlight critical race theory? I'm just saying this is revolutionary family. And also we're going to take a moment. Please join me, family. It has been a traumatic time. We have gone through COVID. We have lost family members. We have lost opportunities. We are trying to regain hope in a capitalist white supremacist system that is changing faster than we know what to deal with. So for just a few moments, family, join me in closing your eyes, centering your soul and going inside and taking that moment to tell yourself, if everything is not okay right now, that is perfectly all right. Thank you so much, family. And again, our condolences to our global family, 7,000 around the world who have lost family members, who have lost, um, let's be honest, family, we've gone through a traumatic experience and we need to acknowledge that. 
In addition, our next topic family is going to be reflecting on the current situation, not only when we talk about our intersectionalities, our positionalities, because we all walk different paths in life. But I, as an indigenous spiritual leader, an educational revolutionary, and graduate student leader of the world's largest, most influential institution in the world, we are here to make change. And we are here to protect our people, and we are here to lift each other up as we take on this wild thing that is called academia, because that is our dream, and that is how we unite together. So, dear family, as we go through our wonderful panelists tonight, let's acknowledge what's happening right? K-12 is changing and it's becoming violent. And those are the places where our children are learning how to be human, but yet they are living in dehumanizing institutions that do not accept them as different, do not accept them as queer or people of color or indigenous. We had to get a task force of a president to say murder to missing indigenous women were an issue. And what? How long have we been colonized since first contact? I'm just saying, family, with increases in violence through social media um, platforms like TikTok, where our students are literally ripping down the restrooms around them, where fights are breaking out in high schools that end up bloodied and battered in a way that we have not seen before. That is frustration of our communities. That is anger. That is emotionality that not only do our students not know how to deal with, but that our teachers are now overwhelmed with. So I'm just saying, family, think about your own positionalities and again, reach out to someone. Please, if you are in a position and have privilege and you feel that you can mentally take it on, be that contact person, be that touchstone for someone. Panic attacks, PTSD is real. I'm a vlogger with 17,000 followers on seven social media platforms and I freely lose my shit online, family. I've had PTSD attacks on camera because I believe it is important for us to realize that human experience is complex. And that although we may be superheroes and put on our cape in the morning, at the end of the day, we are human. So who would like to start off this evening with their reflections specifically on the current lived realities of today, using your own positionality as your reference point, be it as a teacher, as an educator, as a parent, as a community member. I'll, I'll start. <clears throat> so again, Dre was saying uh, she and I are working on a project here. It's actually a multi-site project where we're looking at ethnic studies in New Mexico and in California, particularly San Francisco and LA. And <clears throat> what, what keeps bothering me in this whole conversation is, and what I mean by the conversation is, all it takes is one person from the right to create a culture war, right? It wasn't like <clears throat> several hundred people got together and said, hey, there's CRT in the classroom. All it took was one person who worked in the Heritage Foundation, I believe. Um, and he just went on a couple of shows and talked about CRT and all of a sudden became a hot button issue, right? And the whole hot button issue is uh, white people and other folks. And I don't want to say it's always white because uh, I, I, I often feel like when people talk about CRT, they miss the whole point of, of, of power. And they, they make it sound like it's uh, only white folks that are going out there. There's a whole bunch of people of color, a whole bunch of folks that look like us, who have lived experience as us, who believe in this bullshit, right? And what, what frustrates me is they, they make themselves out to be the victim, right? And say that like they're creating these hostile spaces. But for the reality, uh, myself, right? I'm, I'm, I'm fucking 45 years old, 46 years old, right? Ever since I've been in school, it's been a hostile pay, uh, place. And so many of us who are on this chat uh, who are in grad school, who are in colleges of ed, they didn't necessarily have the best experience in school, right? 
And they never, ever talk about us, how we've been isolated, how we've been attacked, how our voices have been in silence, right? How we've never been represented. And all of a sudden, within the last few years, you know, we're starting to change that. We see it in LA. Well, California was like the first, one of the first states to pra- uh, pass a ethnic studies requirement law. But even in places like Indiana, they're talking about it. In Oregon, they're talking about it. And like, I what I can't stand is why, well, when people talk about minorities, right? They, they never, they think about us. Um, so there's a difference between minority and minoritized, right? They always concentrate on like a few voices, right? Why are we listening to these few voices that are complaining about CRT or complaining, why are you teaching beloved in the classroom uh, or other issues? And if they want us to talk about race without talking about race, I mean, it perfectly encapsulates um, uh, Bonilla Silva's racism without races, right? And so that's what I want to say. Like, you know what? Now is not a time to be silent. Now is a time to basically attack, fight back, and don't, don't allow this false, fake, outrage to dictate the narrative we we are strong right so let us go out there and take over it wasn't you know to look to go back to 40 years 50 years ago when see uh ethnic studies first started people fucking lost their lives i'm sorry to curse but um it's true people went on hunger strikes so that we could have ethnic studies in our universities and later on uh, in our classes, um, the walkouts, not only in East LA, but along the border in Texas, people sacrifice so much. So to honor our ancestors, we must attack. We must fight back. We can't let folks control the narrative. We have to reclaim the narrative. That's basically what it's all about. It's the CRT element of counter storytelling. So thank you. Absolutely, family. Our voices are more powerful, especially when we're united. Who would like to keep on going with that? I think I'll I'll pick up. Um, I do agree that now is not the time to be silent. We do have to keep pushing because the narrative that is being pushed um is one that's incorrect right so we know that crt and being taught in k through 12 education we know that but it's the narrative right it's this fear this white fear that is being pushed right so it is and it, it kind of goes back to crt and education right where whiteness is property where we get to be the dominant society to decide who gets to teach what and how it's taught because let's not pretend that this is just an issue right our history has been written rewritten several times where it's not slavery they're indigenous um and sorry indentured servants right they weren't really slaves or they were fed well or they had housing and shelter so it really wasn't that bad really right so it's not just something that's cropped up right this has been slowly been our history books have been changed little by little by little but now that someone read something oh now it's where we got to pick this up because they saw that all these issues these rights human rights women's rights right all these things were cropping up and now it's now we got to find something else let's pick crt right we don't want our children to be um ostracized because they're white we don't want them to feel bad so we don't want this taught in our schools right it's a constant narrative it is a constant fight to be any person of color in this country is a constant fight a daily fight right racial battle fatigue is real every day it is a look a stare a racial slur Right. You see all these videos and incidents of people just being harassed in the convenience store just for breathing. Right. So it is now right. We have to push back. We have to fight back and we have to keep discussing CRT as much as we can. 
I love it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And I mean, that brings up, sorry, sorry, so Sandy, but real quick, why emotionality? Why fragility? Mm -hmm. Right? How much longer do we as colonized and still enslaved people in 2021, wherever we are now, right, have to, to tiptoe around white people, right? Because that's what it is. I love my family here, but here, even here in these hollowed spaces, right, of criticality, white people are still afraid to say the word white fragility. I had a debate with one of my amazing white sisters who says that it's it's too violent of a word that white people will shut down when they hear that word. And as a white person, they're not willing to take that risk. And I'm like, take the risk, please fucking take the risk. My children are going to look like whites. And my partner and I, who's Blackfeet Nation, we're a proud indigenous couple, right? Fight every day to make sure that our kids, you know, God be willing, get me three, please. In two years, I got to graduate family will know where they came from. I live my entire life on the Rez family. I may be royalty and Rez chic, but I know where I came from. And that's part of the work, right? When people are afraid of ethnic studies in the classroom, what they're saying is that they're threatened by our pride. They're threatened by our language. They're threatened by our culture. They're threatened by our stories. They're threatened by our faces. But that's what we need to be humanized in the classroom, in education, in higher education. I am a human and I deserve to have my people in the classroom, in the books. We made America and it was stolen from us. Sorry, Andy, I love you. <laughs> I just said in my head, yep, she went there. But it's... <laughs> It's such, it's so true, it's so true. Um, you guys will get, I am silly, but I, I, I just get so fired up by hearing all of us and uh, me taking notes as you're speaking and all of you, I'm just like, wow, I needed this. And when I was taking a few notes, um, I, I wrote to myself just now, like, wow, this is so real. Like, what a privilege this is to come to a space like this. And people are just really just calling shit out the way it is. It's, it's like you just don't have this type of space, especially not in academia. So all of my, uh, I would say my brothers, my sisters, my facilitators that are here, please don't apologize because so often we do and we have every right to cuss, to curse and just say our truth. Um, as we're moving on, one of the things I do want to say and why us being in this space is so important because one of the biggest tricks of the devil is to act as if he does not exist. So as you're walking around and you may think sometimes things are quieting down or you don't necessarily see them, does not mean that it's not happening. Usually that's when the most is happening. And when the camera is on, it's pretty much selective of what we're allowed to see of what's going on in our world. So I just ask you guys to go along with the charge of constantly make sure you are conscious about what's happening around you and in society. Because unfortunately, being a person of color, being people of color, we get hit by it the most. So don't get lazy because it's not definitely, it's not just blasting in your face. And before I pass it back on to my baby, I just want to say this. The holiday is coming up. Everybody's getting ready for turkey or whatever you eat. You want to be a little different. You don't have turkey. Please be mindful to hold people around you accountable of what that holiday really means, what it is, and who it originally stood for and who it is for. So as you may be there with your drunken uncle, your drunken mom, or maybe you may be drunk. I am. But just make sure you take a moment to say a prayer. Or if you don't pray, just take a moment to really thank those, those indigenous people that were here, that lived, that made it possible for us to be here. Because guess what? This is their home. I don't care what anyone says. So just be mindful of that. And I'm going to pass it on to my baby, Dre. Thank you, sis. 
All right, family, our next question, because we are critical theorists, family. I'll be honest, I thought COVID would be a game changer, right? I thought universal health care, teachers were lauded as saviors, um, and now we're being criminalized, like, get back in. Oh, sorry, I kicked the table. Uh, get back to work, right? Nothing changed. They sent the military, they sent the police after us. Horrible laws attacking education left and right. Again, ethnic studies is CRT, but they're both related because we're learning about our own selves, our own experiences, our own stories, right? It's it's truth from our people's perspective, but they're the same. It's just, ooh, it sounds scary because there's some Trumpers or, or right wings that are hyping it up, right? Education is political. Let no one ever dissuade you. The only people who try to make it apolitical are the ones in power because their agendas have already been stamped and approved as a, again, family. Remember the founding fathers, going back to critical race theory, our funding, one of our fundamental foundations is that we learn from our history, right? We have to understand our history to make sense of our current lived experiences. Who were our founding fathers? They were a bunch of billionaires who were plantation slave owning white males who did not want to pay their taxes to the King of England. So they had a war and made common people fight for it. Does that sound familiar? Has anything changed since the beginning of this country? We are still ruled by the white landed elite, right? There's a couple people of color, a couple diverse people speckled in there to make sure bootstrapping is still in our recent memory, right? But again, let's talk about COVID and let's talk about some shattered dreams, family. I got some stuff to get off my chest and we can talk to our amazing audience about how you guys think that we can change the world. And hey, this is a community family space. If you need to get something off your chest, by all means, drop it in the chat. What frustrations do we have? Because we thought COVID was going to change everything. Who wants to start us off? So I think... COVID didn't change anything because COVID revealed everything. It basically shined a bright light on what our values are. And our values are, we don't really care about kids. Right? Oh, we don't care about their safety. We don't care whether they live or die. At all. You know, you, you would, it basically reminded me of Sandy Hook. Right? I thought after Sandy Hook, uh, we would we would actually have gun reform laws, right? That the NRA would be obsolete and all that messaging would go away because white children, not just white children, but like kindergartners were killed. But that didn't happen. So I don't know why we were surprised that COVID would change anything. Um, because again, I think the reality is, and I put in the chat, right? We can't forget uh, our ancestor, Franz Fernand, and his fabulous book, Black Skin, White Mask, right? It's not, it's not um, a particular ethnicity. It's not a particular group, right? The, the real challenge is white supremacy. And when, when people hear the, white, the word white supremacy, you automatically think about white. Right, and they forget the supremacy part, but it's a whole ideology, it's a whole uh, culture, it's a whole hege hegemony of of thinking. It's, it's a habitus, right? Um, uh, and so like COVID didn't, COVID wouldn't change anything because we're already ingrained in this country and our society to believe whose life and worth is valuable, right? And it's like what Dre was saying, it's the elites, right? I mean, that, that's why you can have governors like Santis and Abbott and other folks get away with what they're getting away with. Um, and like, you know, people keep saying the word Trump, right? He's not the problem. You know, he, he just built, he's just the master of, of uh, inciting rage and tapping into white rage, right? as our sister Carol Anderson has talked about, right? But he's not the issue. The real issue is we've been dealing with this for the past 30 years, trying to get rid of our votes, 
trying to get rid of wages, trying to uh, reduce health access, right? This is not a new thing. Everything that we see in COVID and that's being stressed and highlighted with COVID has been happening, right? That's why you see people not, they're basically like saying, fuck, I'd rather be unemployed and going back to a job, right? And people keep saying, well, um, I know I deal with this all the time uh, with my daughter's teacher and I, she's misinformed. She keeps thinking that they're still getting like these uh, unemployment checks. That's long past. People are basically refusing um, to go back to work because like, why should I? Why should I work at McDonald's or Walmart or any other place when they don't give a damn about my life? They don't protect me, right? And so I think, you know, we have a moment of truth right, right here. You know, Jay-Z has a famous song called Moment of Clarity, right? Where he basically reveals all his inner truths, right? So we have a moment of clarity right now of what are we willing to die for? What are we, what are we willing to sacrifice? Because I know for me, I'm not going to allow all the anti-vaxxers, all the folks who say Trump, but in reality, it's not just Trump, it's the Democrats too, Right. They took a bill that was supposed to be the Biden's agenda that was six point five trillion and we reduced it to one point five trillion. And they're basically telling us we should accept it. And that if we if we don't accept it and we lose the, the House and the Senate, it's our fault. But fuck that. You should have fought harder for us. We fucking put you in the White House. Right. Two folks from Georgia. So you got to fight for us. If you're not willing to fight for us, we'll find somebody else. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, COVID has, I, I agree that COVID revealed a lot of things, a lot of things that are broken um, in this country. Uh, access to health care and um, people work in jobs that are low wage who still continued to have to work, right? So it initially when everything was shut down, um, folks still having to go to work in grocery stores and, and all those type places and those low wage jobs, putting themselves at risk and their families at risk um, because it was clear that this country didn't care anything about its people, but they wanted to keep the economy going, right? It's like we still have people still have to work. Um, and so it was, it shined a light on just how much this country values money over people. Um, and in terms of access to benefits, how hard it was for people to get unemployment. And of course, just the whole pushback for wearing a simple piece of cloth over your face, right? Just it was just, I wish I could say I was surprised, but every time I, I see and hear, it's just mind blowing that people have such an uproar about something that is so very simple about protecting you and other people. So I think COVID has, again, revealed to those who already know uh, what this country is all about. It just keeps revealing itself. Uh, and people are there to see it. So I'm, I, of course, stand in solidarity with everyone who had to put their lives on the line to help people, our healthcare workers, people who work in the grocery stores. I, you know, most want to acknowledge those folks who put their lives on the line every day um, during all of this and who lost lives, who lost family members um, because they had inadequate health care, okay? Um, we still need to talk about that. That conversation still needs to keep going uh, and people need health care. They need a livable wage, right? Um, so hopefully we can keep those conversations going uh, and do what we need to do and to keep, keep that fight going, right? Absolutely. Andy, I think you have the last word on this topic. Well, I just um, as hearing 
Che and Chi speak, it, it made me think, and probably some of you that are in the audience can relate to this, how this virus, like she said, this, this isn't new. It's not just a Trump issue. Um, this was long before Trump. Honestly, Trump was just bold, bold enough to just say it. And in a lot of ways, uh, there may be a lot of people that agree with me, but I'm kind of glad there was a Trump because it kind of forces some of the naysayers to remove that veil that so many hid behind. Uh, one thing I, I want to say personally is, and maybe y'all can relate to this, like last week, two weeks ago, I had got a cold. And the first thing I thought was, God, please hope I don't have COVID. Like it has changed everything. You hear someone cough and it's like <laughs> for the border. It's, it's so bad, but it has literally exposed so much. I didn't have COVID, but thankfully, but I tell you this, I ran to get a COVID uh, check to see was I okay but it's just that I think everything happens for a reason. And again, I, I think I just don't want anyone to become comfortable. And because it's not in front of us or it's not on the news every day like it is, please don't let that fool you because that's a lot of times, really oftentimes is what it's intended to do to distract you and say, look over there. Well, everything else is happening. But I think it's also a chance for pioneers like ourselves and trailblazers to do some great work. And I just want us all to hold on to that and the community that we have with us. Cause man, these are some powerful folks and those that I can't see, just the fact that you're here, that says so much and really does inspire me. So. Let's just keep on keeping on, family. Just keep on keeping on. Just keep on keeping on. Woohoo! Thank you so much for our inspirational words from our sis Andy. Our next topic, family, is gonna get a little closer to home. So let's put our our empathy hats on and let's think about what's actually going on in K twelve classrooms because we are the American Education Research Association. And not only are we parents, right? And I have 23 nieces and nephews from around the world, family, two at UNM. They eat a lot and they're very expensive <laughs> and they like fancy shit. I'm just saying, my nephews, I love them, right? But while we're trying to figure out how to make ends meet, right? How to, to literally you need a second job to pay for healthcare for your kids now. I mean, excuse me, childcare right now. Don't even get me started on healthcare if you don't have it through your work already. But let's talk about how do we feel, right, going into the field of education or if you're in the classroom right now, because everything changed, right? So we have laws that are changing in states like Arizona. It has been updated, it has been massaged, they've taken some teeth out. But two months ago, right, if you were a teacher in K-12 and you were thought to have made your white students feel uncomfortable about race, right, talked about a theory or heaven forbid, teach them history, right? Slavery, colonization, uh, white supremacy is real, right? We as whiteness, uh, critical race scholars, right? My fields of study are whiteness, intersectionality, and critical race theory, right? I specialize in white allyship, which means family, I work with white people and bring on critical white allies, which is why I talk a lot about white fragility, right? But these issues that we talk about in academia and the tower, like white fragility, right? Which again, is not family not your emotional individual fragileness as a person. We all get hurt, right? Absolutely, we're human. But we're talking about, again, goes back to the power dynamics of what right, white fragility means, right? Because white parents were uncomfortable about having to talk about race in the schools, they passed a law that made it illegal for teachers to talk about race in school. So because of white parents' emotional backlash, a law was put in place that criminalized our fellow teachers in K-12 family. So right now I have some amazing, uh, especially in Ujima, in Crisea, literally our program who are in the classrooms right now and have to report literally going back to, I don't know what in my imagination would be the 1950s of having to tell their students of color, we'll talk about slavery after lunch, right? 
again, two months ago, under the threat of your personal assets could be sued, your teaching license could be taken away, $5,000 could be taken from you because you'd be fined. So these are not, again, we're, we're dealing as people of color, as critical scholars, as realists in the real world who have been living with microaggressions our entire lives, right? All we're actually doing is asking for everyone else to acknowledge our lives, our everyday experiences, right? That's what we're actually asking. But that it literally comes back in the form of legal policing, um, over surveillance, our children being cut out of economic and educational opportunities. So what do you think, do family, in, in the comments, if you guys could drop us some wonderful ideas, right? This is a healing space of learning, community, and sharing. And you have the experts, family. Um, Dr. Desai is uh, a professor at the University of, excuse me, uh, I want to say assistant professor. <laughs> is that right? Did I get that right? Associate. I got, I got Associate. tenure. Associate. Yeah. Woo! that happened family happy dance and maybe he can share some tips with us later because i'm just saying family as a person of color right i'm i'm two-spirited not transgender family which means i have a female self and a male self but i'm also lgbtq i've also survived trauma but i also have white privilege and light in the form of lightness privilege right and i have class privilege and people like our wonderful family here who comes in all shades and colors and experiences and backgrounds and class and languages and citizenships will have a different experience getting into academia based on our positionalities, based on, again, we are critical race scholars in this space, how close you align to whiteness. So if you have questions, if you're scholars of color who are coming up, you literally have the people who've been tearing down those barriers. And if you have any specific questions, this would be the place. So family, the topic on the table now is what do you think the future of education is? And right now, what do you think we can do to support educators in the classroom? So the question is, what is the future of education and what can we do to support educators in the classroom right now? I made it too complicated. Let's do future next. What do you think we can do to support educators in the classroom right now? OK. I mean, ever since the civil rights movement, even before the civil rights movement, we've always relied on youth, young people to lead the way. When we think about like uh, our leaders, right? Whether it be Fannie, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Hamer or uh, Martin Luther King or Becky Evers or Martin Luther, uh, uh, Malcolm X, right? Um, you know, the name escapes me right now, but the the, the leaders of uh, the LGBT LGBTQIA um, rights in, um, in New York, they were trans, young trans folks of color, right? So we always relied on young people. And yet young folks, unfortunately, have to carry the burden. Um, and all we can do is support and help them tap into their ancestors, right? The ancestors who, uh, for example, the Birmingham, um, and during the civil rights march, right? I mean, the civil rights movement, Birmingham, the, the, the pictures and images you see of the dogs being sicked on people, the water hoses, or well, in Birmingham, it was young kids, right? That that you know, it, it took me up until like this year to realize it was uh, young kids that were leading the way, and like um, the images that we see of people being attacked, they were young children, and so we just have to support young folks as much as we can. And again, I go back to yeah, there's the. The, the folks that are complaining about CRT in the classroom. But then on the flip side, there's families and communities and students that, that have always, always demanded that we be heard. Man, I don't care if it's East LA or in the 1960s um, in New York, it was uh, parents and young kids in Brooklyn, 
that basically made way for the decentralization of New York City uh, schools. So as much as we can, we have to let young folks and parents and community know that their voices matter as well. And what's good is there's already amazing community organizations on the ground that are doing that work. So it's up to higher ed, uh, not just higher ed, but everybody to find those organizations and work with them to ensure that whoever's running for the school board isn't gonna run to take away everything that we fought in, in place, but actually working with them to ensure that the school board members are the ones that we wanna support. Uh, you, working with them to pressure schools and principals and superintendents to make sure that they don't go back on the on, on their work, right? Like we didn't fight for ethnic studies just for it to be taken away after a year. So as much as the other side can be loud, we can be equally as loud and create as much chaos. Yes, I agree. Now is not the time to be silent. I mean, whatever advocacy looks like for you, whether it's um, emailing your local school board members, your principals and administrators, your legislators at the local, state, and federal level, I mean, whatever that looks like to you, now is not the time. We have to protect those teachers who cannot protect themselves for fear of losing their jobs, but also, you know, whatever in whatever capacity you can educate your children at home, you know, about the true facts of history. Um, because if the schools won't teach them, we can still teach them the true history of this country, of themselves, of their culture. Um, to give them something to be proud about. You know, we see a lot of children because the school system has failed to teach the truth who do not know the true history of this country, right? So we have to educate them along the way. And yes, we, and that also empowers our youth to speak up. There's a group of kids, I can't remember what town, um, that launched a protest themselves um, because there were kids walking around with Confederate flags uh, and the school did nothing. And so the next day they planned a silent protest across the street from the school. And yes, they were suspended, but the parents were there to support them. And sometimes, right, we, our kids, we will get in trouble, we'll get suspended, but they stood for something. They decided we're not going to allow this to happen in our schools and we're going to do something about it. So teaching them what true advocacy, what true silent protest, standing up for what type of education you want to have, and also saying, this is not okay and I'm going to do something about it, right? So I think that's also important that we have to get behind our children, but we have to realize again, that this is not a time to remain silent. Wow. Wow, I'm just sitting here nodding as you, both of you were talking and smiling. Shay, I'm really glad you're here and I hope to meet you in person one day, both of you. Um, I mean, after hearing both of them speak, uh, family, I don't know if there's much to say. You know, one of the things I will point out is being from North Jersey, um, the inner city, uh, Irvington, New Jersey. I always say I grew up on both sides of the tracks, but something that people would say in the streets is real bad boys move in silence. And I would say that for girls too, real bad girls move in silence. So although you may not can be straightforward with your message, doesn't mean that your message isn't being heard or you're not doing anything in the background. So just make sure as you're moving, sometimes it's best to keep things quiet, but continue to do what needs to be done. I love it. Sage advice is sage advice. Don't forget, family, thank you so much for sharing with us in the comments. Um, 
let's see here. Some of the ideas begin with leveled professional development with the goal to transition to multi-level professional development um, for Monica. And Marisa says, I'm seeing commodified tapping into ancestors. It looks like a lot has been made up and has become performative to commodify. It's disturbing. Um, well, I mean, we're seeing that a lot at universities where there's everyone has an indigenous land acknowledgement. <laughs> and I, as an indigenous person, forget all the time, y'all, because I'm walking around on my land all the time. So it's not something like I stop and think about, but I'm, I'm grateful, I think, uh, that people are doing it, but I'm not sure again how effective it is. Right? Are there conversations being had around that? Yeah. What's the action behind it? Um, even here at Crisea, because you know this coyote's always late family. So for the opening ceremony, I was still getting ready, and they did an indigenous land acknowledgement. But I wasn't sure if the person who did it was indigenous because I was listening to it. Um, and I wasn't watching the screen, but someone had acknowledged that, right? Like the deeper meaning behind it. One of the people who was in the audience actually spoke up about it. Um, so I guess. We've always been fighting the commodification though, right? The images that they take from us. There's a great book, um, it's by Deloria. It's gonna kill me family. I think I wanna say Vine, but it's called Playing Indian. And it talks about whites in particular co-opting Indian identity, right? That they wanna have a connection. And that again goes back to um, the land bridge theory, right? Bering Straits. These Native American, how dare they say we stole the land from them? We have to have a scientific educational theory to disprove them and prove that they came from Asia, even Billy, you know, whatever. It's been disproven, family. There's so much in anthropology, sociology has come out. It's been smashed to pieces, but it goes back to white fantasy. Because again, education is a socialization process, right? We're creating citizens. We're creating what we think is a good American, right? So remember, education is always political. And we as educators have power because our work is literally redefining the fields, right? These, my brothers and sisters here on this call are, are leaders literally in critical race studies, right? So critical race studies and education association is the association family in, in the United States for critical race studies. So these family members, we got cred family. <laughs> So make sure you know your sources too, right? And, and go, go live, go do the readings, right? You have to do the work. Um, and that's really what this is, is that we are always learning, right? I might look young family, but I'm 40. I've been educated for 15 years and I'm still learning. I, I just learned the internet, right? I have 17,000 vloggers on seven social platforms. I was two years ago, like, why are you on Facebook? And now I'm always like 40 hours a week because it's my job, right? We're always learning family. And when we stop growing, we start dying. So I'm just saying, join us in the revolution and learn more about what critical race theory is. Let's look at a couple more comments. Um, thank you again, see you for, for watching these. Um, we can't be passive. So uh, John is saying we can't be passive. Hitler started with school curriculum. Exactly. Right. So again, they were creating German citizens for a reason, right? With with something in mind. Going back to the founding of America family, again, blacks were written in as three fifths of a human being. Uh Native Americans were called savages of the wild, and they turned in our scalps because they hunted us down during this time period. We were never immigrants weren't even seen as people. We were never imagined to be part of what this thing is America. And ever since its conception, we've been fighting to be acknowledged. And we are just the new warriors, right? Our ancestors did not go down being like laying down, like I'm just gonna accept segregation, right? We know that. We know that Martin Luther King was a revolutionary and wanted by the FBI, but history gets rewritten by the conquerors. So remember that family. We as educators have so much power but once we put our voices together, that's when we're unstoppable. Because as individuals, that principal can come and bully us. That chair of our department can come and threaten us with our ability to get tenure. Or those other people who are uncomfortable can come and try to silence you. 
but we are hardened warriors who will help lift you up and give you that pep talk because that's what we do. We're mentors. And that brings us to our next topic, family, because I know you all have a wealth of information. Did, did anyone, we finished last one, right? Mm -hmm. um, a wealth of information. And we have an audience of amazing graduate students from around the world who are literally joining the battle or have been in the battle this whole time, right? But again, reflecting on our past, reflecting on our current experience and reflecting on what we learned from COVID, what advice would you give our family? They are educators going out into the world or as community members. But what is your tidbit of advice for our amazing A year A GSC Global Family? She's about to start. I think the most important thing I learned is you got to take care of yourself. And be care be careful of who you roll with. That's what I would say. Not everybody that you roll with is actually there to support you or have your back. Um and then the last thing is, you know, prioritize what's most meaningful to you. I think like what you were saying, like the chair or the dean may say something like, oh, you can't do this work. But at the end of the day, they can say it, but that doesn't have to stop you. Because at the end of the day, it's really about publications. Oh, you could criticize the university. Um, as much as you want but the university is not gonna deny you tenure because you criticized it. All the university cares is, wow, you published in so-and-so, right? So I, a lot of times people will state advice, you can't do this type of work uh, until post tenure. And I'm here to tell you, nah, that, that's the worst advice you can ever get. Do you, uh, people are gonna hate on you if they want, um, the, the key to tenure, it's really, you just got to be fake nice to certain people. And I hate to say it, but that's true. Uh, not everybody in your department is going to have your back. And that's okay. You just have to be fake nice with them, say general greetings, and do what, do, do what you're passionate about. Because at the end of the day, people will, will scare the shit out of you and say, you can't do this, you can't do that. But I'm telling you, as someone who just recently got tenure, the work that I did wasn't necessarily supported by my department, wasn't supported by my chair. All they cared about was, oh, wow, you got this award, you got this grant, you published here and there. They didn't care what I talk about. They just cared... Am I being, quote, unquote, a productive scholar? So you get to define what it means to be a productive scholar. So if that means working with community, then you do that. If that means publishing in um, local journals and doing a lot of community work, then you do that. But you just have to be mindful of what is it that your college what are they looking for? What is their criteria for um, tenure? And as long as you meet that criteria, you're fine. But don't let anybody try to pigeonhole you and try to tell you what you can and you can't do. You dictate the terms. And that, that would be my advice. Okay, I'll... Go, I'll, I'll try to follow that up. <laughs> um, but I do um, believe just going forward, engage in any sort of self-care that you can. You know, we're still in this this pandemic. Um, you know, we're still trying to, trying to fight our way back to something because I don't want to call it 
uh, back to normal because I don't think anything will ever be normal anymore. Uh, so take care of yourself, take care of your family, um, do the work, um, especially as graduate students. You know, we're out here trying to trying to get where uh, she is. Uh, so we're trying to take that journey, right? So do the work, read, um, lean on people who have that knowledge and who have that experience. I know I definitely am. Uh, and find your people. Find your people, those folks who will support you. Sandy? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to say last, but certainly not least, I mean, you have to keep your community. And for those of you out there, like perhaps that don't want to necessarily get into academia because it's such a, it takes a very strong person to continuously be true to themselves and I really take my hat off to she because you really don't find folks like that too often. Uh, they they really are a diamond in the rough. But I just want you to know that if you're not going on an academic route, that there's so many other opportunities that where we need people like you to make change, to be at the table, to change policy. Um, to really hold people accountable, the people that are in there already. Uh, teaching has become such a, for a lack of better words, turn off to so many people, including myself. But we definitely need more teachers. Um, I'm sure most of you know, not, not wanting to get theoretical on you, but over 80% of our teachers in public schools are white females who come from middle class communities. And these women are typically the ones in the front of the class that are teaching diverse learners. So again, you need to find your community. You need to be reminded of why you're in this work. You need to, even though if you're tired and it's a Friday, you can be out drinking margaritas and crossing your legs or like myself, listening to house music and just wishing that you were in New York instead of State College. you got to take time to be fired up and reminded that you're not alone because it can become stressful. Um, it can cause serious anxiety. It can cause a lot of mental health illnesses. So definitely find your people, find your people, rely on your people, text your people, call your people. You need them. And I'm just going to say this. There's not a lot of us. Um, there's not, unfortunately. So you may have to be fake nice as she said I suck at that but I'm charming so that helps so find your find your niche to kind of navigate this system you know you have to but lastly just make sure you stay true to you and really stay true to the people that are good to you I'm Absolutely, sis. And shout out to our sister, Jonna. Apologize if I didn't pronounce that right. But absolutely, we need to reach uh, rural teachers, right? And teaching CRT to classroom teachers is difficult. Um, and not that we don't know how to do it and not that we can't do it, but literally it's because of the emotionality and the colonialism and the slavery and racism in America and the political power of whiteness that shackles us as teachers to talk about it, right? They'll literally throw a law at you or rewrite the curriculum um, or reimagine who Martin Luther King was, <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr., right? right. Uh, he was a revolutionary preacher who was marching right. in the streets and like rabble rousing and wanted by the FBI. But in history books, he gets a paragraph as a peacekeeper. Yes. Right? So I'm just saying family, we we're warriors right and and your research matters someone is gonna read that article and quote you and cite you and believe you to be the expert so what we're asking you to do is to continue learning with us right because the publications that steve and i have i think we're up to three journal articles 
And whoa, this coyote just got my first book chapter published solo this year, family. Yeah, Necessary Narratives of COVID. Um, Dio Press, family, check it out. Um, but I'm saying as we are all going into academia or in education or in classrooms, even when you're in a classroom, your students still look to you. You are still the authority, right? On knowledge for them. So that is power and that is voice. And that's why we're pushing CRT as a humanizing way because what it is, is it's, it's using vocabulary and explaining the structures and the institutions and taking it away from making it individual white people, because that's not what we're talking about, family. When we talk about white supremacy, we talk about coloniality, we talk about whiteness and privilege, we're not talking about individual white people. We're talking about the collective power that decisions that affect people who look white, but control our lives. Right, the laws that are passed, the extra surveillance in our communities, the policing of our communities, the cradle to prison pipeline, all of the amazing things that our fellow CRT scholars at this conference, because we are live from the Critical Race Studies and Education Conference here at the University of Maryland family that we are all participating in, right? So, oh, Delaware, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ooh, I apologize, Delaware. Seriously, there's some beef. I don't know if you know this, but there's beef between Maryland and Delaware. I apologize, Delaware. <laughs> um, so family, uh, we're going to do two more questions. We're going to get out of here because we have some receptions to go to. Um, but in the last thing, let's talk about the future of education as our last thought. But they asked us in the readings to talk about some readings, right, or critical race theories, like where to start, right? You want to learn more about critical race theory. Can you guys touch on maybe one or two pivotal artists? Um, art, they are artists <laughs> as well, right? Creatives. Um, that really touched your lives. And I'm going to go first, you guys, because this one I'm burning. <laughs> Derek Bell is the father of critical race theory family, and he changed my life. He was a badass. He was Harvard educated, came out of critical legal studies, right? So this was a black man from Harvard who's telling people this, the permanence of racism. He literally defined the permanence of racism in our society and calls it out. And he also established counter storytelling because he used sci-fi stories, family. He used made up stories to talk about the realities of our life and problematize it. And that's why this coyote decided to use videos and I use storytelling and yeah. It, it, we're, we're fighting for souls. That's the souls, bodies, and minds for the survival of our communities, family. Because again, I will keep repeating this forever. We still live in a colonialized society. We still are affected by slavery, except for now it's in the form of prisons, right? As technology grows, our poor white communities, our communities of color will continue to be incarcerated. But now instead of incarcerating them because of things like COVID, they're gonna ankle bracelet them. And in cities like Chicago and inner cities, they've already done this surveillance in those communities, right? And you can't nary walk out of line without them knowing. So I'm saying, do we want to continue the state of incarceration of our people? Or are we gonna use our educational voices to make some change? So ha, I picked Derek Bell. Who's gonna go next? Um, I'll continue with Derek Bell. Um faces at the bottom of the well. Um, and I would also say, um, I call it the big red book, <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> critical race theory, the key writings that led to the movement um, by Kimberly Crenshaw. <laughs> Outside of the big red book, I call it the beast. But um, <laughs> yes, that, that is a fantastic book to get a clear foundation of them critiquing the constitution uh so that is definitely one that i would recommend and faces at the bottom of the well because i love his uh parable about afrolantica mm -hmm. uh so that is amazing and i wish afrolantica could happen for real but uh <laughs> i would definitely recommend both of those I think there's a lot of ancestors of CRT that don't get acknowledged as being CRT scholars. So for me, um, W.B. Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson, right? And then poets, 
like June Jordan, um, Sonia Sanchez, um, Amiri Baraka, Tony Medina, um, and there's like countless others I can I can say, but I, I would say don't forget the the ancestors ancestors. Um, and then the most important thing is you got to read indigenous scholars or folks who do indigenous work because CRT um, tackles one aspect, but indigenous scholars tackle a whole different aspect. And I think a lot of times CRT scholars need to be in conversation with indigenous scholars. And I saw Andrea, I mean, Dre put uh, Brave Boy, but I'm not even talking about Brave Boy. I'm talking about like uh, what you were talking about, Vine, Deloria, Visner, uh, who came up with Survivance and other folks. Because uh, CRT is not isolated. It's, it's in, one of the beautiful things about CRT is that it's informed by so many different things. So check out what it's informed by so that um, Andy put The Bridge Call My Back. That's another good book. So, so yeah, that's what that would be my advice. Yeah, look at CRT, but look at other stuff too. I don't know, but you all are getting some real knowledge today. Um, I, it got me writing. But um, I just say, and I'll go back to this, like sometimes in this work, you can really just feel like you're kind of drowning and having the references of your people, whether that is physical or in the literature is necessary. Um, you should, I hope all of you have kind of like that chest of your go-to where you just need to uh, consume yourself with knowledge of people that are speaking your language. It's just so uh, relevant. I was just looking at my bookshelf now and I've been working all day. So I'm not going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. My brain is like, uh, it's been one of those days, but I do say, um, as I wrote in the chat and as uh, we're like signing out, I'll just take a look and really want to give you some, uh, oh yeah, Patricia Hills College. She's really good too, guys. You should really check her out as well. I have a few of hers and don't forget Pablo Ferre, like that dude, he's like an oldie book goodie. You know, you can just never get tired of him. He is just so like awesome. So just make sure that you keep your treasure chest of those people that you need to remind you of why you're doing this work, to remind you that you're not crazy and to give you the courage to continue on. And what I'll do, I'll just, as, as, as I said, as we're closing out, I'll just put some additional uh, readings inside of the chat. And if you have any questions, I'm sure all of us would say, feel free to reach out to us if you just need something a little more, a little extra. We should have like kind of like a shared nerd, a shared nerd book recommendation list or something like that. <laughs> To just share our knowledge with each other. I think that would be really cool because you never know what we're doing to stay abreast of things. So um, Sheev just shared his email address and I'll be sure to do the same. And Dre and uh, Shay, let's just do that. We need that. And answer your emails, folks. I mean it. All right, I'll pass it back. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I just wanted to give it back to our panel really quickly. Our sister Shay is putting in her email real quickly. Who wants to say any burning last remarks, anything to our amazing audience? Again, thank you so much to our attendees, our panelists, to the amazing family here at the Critical Race Studies and Education Association for hosting this amazing conference and for giving us an opportunity to share our expertise and scholarship with our AERA GSC Global family. Any last words, family, before we sign off? I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say uh, 
a lot of us, when we enter grad school, we have quote unquote imposter syndrome because uh, we're surrounded by such brilliant folks. And sometimes we question, do we belong here? Or we'll have um, certain professors who don't necessarily believe in us, right? Who intentionally or unintentionally make us feel like we don't belong. And what I would say is, you got in because you do belong. Like someone believed in you. Um, so don't, don't ever fall into that trap of imposter syndrome. You are smart. I'm not gonna do the whole, uh, <laughs> you are smart, you are beautiful, but I would say at the end of the day, you gotta believe in yourself. Like you do belong. And one, one of the things I tell Dre all the time is, the only way to, well, I guess the academy may never change, but the only way it can be pushed is if we have more people who are critical scholars, right? Who are willing to sacrifice. And unfortunately, you are sacrificing, right? You're sacrificing your health, your emotional state of being to change the academy. Um, but don't let that stop you. Don't let the microaggression stop you. Don't let the overt aggression stop you, you belong, you're here uh, and keep doing the amazing work that you're going to be doing because we need it. I guess we had to drop the mic with that folks. You know, that's just the bar is closed, I guess, you know, this is just, that's right, you know, imposter syndrome is real. And that's why I'll bring you back to make sure you have your community and believe the people that believe in you. That's what I'll close up with. Believe the people that believe in you because sometimes you can be our worst critics. I know I am. So make sure you just always find those people that say, you know, you may be different, but you're great. You may be funny, but you're great. You may be loud or you may just come up and just say the truth that you're great. Just make sure you keep those people in your front pocket. Sorry, one moment, family. We're letting Shay put in her LinkedIn oh. <laughs> real quick. Go ahead and put your LinkedIn so that you can contact us, please. Um, Go ahead and feel free. We are resources family. Again, we are all connected with the Critical Race Studies and Education Association. Steve and I serve as this, our second year as mentors for the Ujima program. Um, and we're here to support and raise. And Andy, my amazing chair elect, woohoo, is going to be taking over the AUA GSC next year, family. But you know, this coyote has big plans for the rest of our year currently. So if you would like to learn more about our amazing organization, don't forget to go to our website, aura.net. As well, you can always email this coyote because we currently have open positions for our five ad hoc committees, family. We are here to bring you academic events every month, one community building event per a semester. We are also going to be raising a social justice committee, family, because I have asked the American Education Research Association to allow us as students, to allow us as members to start collecting data on the trauma where experiences literally in higher education family. On a personal basis, this coyote has taken an advocacy role, six cases to the Office of Equity or the Office of Equal Opportunity, anywhere from uh, incidents that end in hospitalization to microaggressions to people with disabilities and discrimination. We have done it, family, and we are here to support you. So if you need help, if you need support, do not hesitate. AERA GSC is here to support you. We love you. Thank you for spending some time with us. Have a wonderful night. And we are all off to cause trouble somewhere else. <laughs>